Welcome back to Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped. Last time, we unlocked the final warp room. We're in the home stretch, but we still have a few more things to do in one particular level here, which we'll get to at the start of this. Firstly though, just something to point out, as we approach this, you might notice that uh, one of the, um, the N-Corp logo on one of the buildings in the distance starts spinning. So every warp room except the second and third has some detail like that. For example, as we approach the first one, uh, the gears in the background there start turning, and we already saw what happens with the fourth one, the flame torches light. So our first stop is going to be the secret warp room again, because I've got 20 relics. Now, technically speaking, it is possible to have 20 relics before you enter Future Frenzy for the first time. You would just need to get relics out of a few of the secret levels, but I decided to do it this way. So, by unlocking this portal with 20 relics, we can now get 100% of Future Frenzy. And I'm going to let Coco take this one so that she completely finishes out the fourth warp room. So yeah, already in the death route music, essentially. Now I'm just going to stay here for a second, just in case that doesn't break everything. Yeah, it broke everything, that's fine. But yeah, already the jumps here are a little trickier, and the enemy formations are getting uh, a little bit more interesting than they were in the um, original version of this level. Well, I mean, it still technically is the original version, but uh, our first pass-through, basically. They're doing a few more unique things with the UFO lab assistance, and a lot of nitros around here. Okay, now I'm always suspicious when I ever see something like this because I think that there's going to be like a TNT somewhere in it, but it turns out, nope. Not this time. Okay, yeah, just waiting for you platforms, obviously. So, there's evidence in the alpha build of this game that this level's name was originally Fast Forward. So there were quite a few levels that changed names during production. One other interesting detail is that Boneyard and Dino Might had their level names swapped around. As in, Dino Might was going to be the first one, and Boneyard the name of the second uh, prehistoric level. There's also another level with an alternate name that we'll um, be seeing in this part. So the weird thing about this alternate route is it drops you off kind of in the middle of the 2D section, so we actually have to backtrack quite a lot here. Future Frenzy is a bit of an interesting level to get the gem on. I forget if this is before or after the bonus. Yeah, there's a few more details about those UFOs from the, um from that alpha build. The death animation associated with them was actually just the same one as, um... Okay, yeah, it's a lot for, uh, further back in the bonus. But yeah, the same one as, um, for falling in lava in the prehistoric levels. And there are a lot, like, they looked a lot more like the heated enemies from, um, from Crash 2. Okay, now backtracking here is definitely an issue thanks to the bottomless pits and the um, lasers, so we have to backtrack all the way to the beginning of the level essentially, so yeah, Future Frenzy, like I said, interesting level to do 100%. And the second um, future level is also an interesting one. It also has an alternate path that drops you off in kind of an interesting location. Okay, at least we uh, we can definitely see those lasers. Almost spun that nitro there. Are there lasers back there? Not sure, but there's definitely a conveyor belt. And well, there are lasers, but um, not exactly over that pit. I guess um, more things to talk about here would be the fact that. Yeah, I've been researching more into that alpha build lately, and it's something that I might want to kind of talk about in the future. Maybe in its own video. And yeah, here we are back at the beginning of the level, so now we can head back. And we already have 71 boxes. I think actually this level has the most boxes of any level in the game. But regarding that alpha build, the locations of a lot of the colored gems were swapped around. 
So, if I'm remembering right, Deep Trouble originally had the blue gem instead of the red gem. High Time originally had the red gem instead of the purple gem. And the purple gem was in Tomb Raider. And they also swapped around a lot of the... the gem platforms in the levels. For example, the blue gem path in Sphinxinator was originally a um, green gem path. And the purple gem path was also on a different level to what it was originally, but we'll get to that one later. And so we've finally caught back up. So we can keep um, heading further into the level, knowing that this time we can actually get the box gem. Again, we could have done this on our first pass to the level, but um, it would have required uh, getting a few relics out of the order that I intend to go for the relics in, and also would have required visiting a couple of secret levels that, well, I want to save until after the final boss, because they're technically considered levels 31 and 32, although there are a few interesting quirks with that also in the alpha version. In particular, Ski Craze still existed, but it was a completely different level. Also in the Alpha build, a couple of bosses, um, specifically Engine and Cortex's boss fights didn't exist. Um, you got the Bazooka automatically, and don't worry, I will be showing the Bazooka eventually, but yeah, you got the Bazooka automatically upon, um getting 20 crystals, and you got uh, the power from, that you would have got from Cortex from uh, Entropy, who was still the third boss, so that's kind of strange. But yeah, I will be showing the bazooka, don't worry. It just feels a little more natural introducing it in um, the first level that I plan on covering in the fifth warp room because that level always felt like a natural kind of tutorial to the bazooka. You know, when you get to crouch on conveyor belts and still move despite being in a in a state that normally keeps you standing still. Don't know why that spin just barely doesn't last long enough to break that last box, but oh well. Okay, don't hit that. Yep, there we go, that's the box jam. Future Frenzy is complete, and that finishes up Warp Room 4. I'll be staying as Coco for now because I want to give both of these siblings equal screen time in this last warp room, which means I'll take on a couple of levels here as Coco at least. So, we now have 76%. I kind of wish it was an even 75, but oh well. So, let's check out the levels we have in the fifth and final warp room with its lime green buttons. We have Gone Tomorrow, or um, in the alpha version of the game, simply Future 2. Orange Asphalt, which in the alpha version of the game was misspelled. Flaming Passion, which in the alpha version of the game was called Crash Kebab. Mad Bombers, which did not have a different name in the alpha version. And Bug Light, which in the alpha version was called Egypt 4. So they clearly hadn't decided on names for a few of these levels, but I'm going to be breaking the level order again for this warp room and entering Flaming Passion first. Reason being is that Gone Tomorrow has the green gem path and it's required to get the box gem, so may as well do this one first. And honestly, I actually feel like they did intend for you to do this one right after finishing warp room 4 because this level is basically a, no pun intended, crash course on the fruit bazooka. 
And it's kind of interesting because the level, like, never really tells you that it's a tutorial for the bazooka, but it sort of is. So, uh, we have those guys, and we don't want to get up in their face because, well, they have swords, and unlike uh, Aladdin, we don't have one. But we do have a bazooka. So you press the button to take it out, and you have a uh, laser aim here, and you can press the, um, in my case, the A button to fire Wumba Fruit. This does not actually cost Wumba Fruit. But something else we can do with the bazooka here is... Uh, we have to wait till they poke their heads out. But we can actually shoot the fire-throwing lab assistants, and doing so makes the window look boarded up, which is kind of funny. So, yeah, these levels in particular, well, I mean, levels in general get a lot easier once you have the bazooka. It is kind of a game-breaker overall, but it does slow down the gameplay quite a bit. And yeah, the bazooka instantly destroys you. But yeah, these, the segments with the fire throwers are a lot easier to go through once you have this. You can block off these windows to uh, prevent the fire from uh, being thrown at you at all. And obviously getting through this level safely is paramount because there's a death route in this level. We've still got one more fire shot before you went down. we shoot the crystal? Doesn't look like we can. Yeah, the aiming on it can be a little bit awkward if you're trying to aim backwards, but you usually don't need to aim backwards all that much. Although, um, yeah, something to point out about the bazooka, which does involve aiming backwards, and is probably the one time you usually will do that, you can get a little bit of a um, second head start on time trials if you walk a little bit ahead of the clock and then shoot it with the bazooka. Some of the Platinum Times nearly require this treatment. Because they have such tight timings that you really need to take every advantage you can get. Oh, yep, there's a there's fire on that one. Almost forgot about that. I was like, there's gonna be fire on that, isn't there? But yeah, we've reached the Death Root platform. So, in the Alpha version of the game, I know I keep mentioning it, but I did um, just look that one up recently. This Death Root was completely, well, incomplete. But the transition from the main level on the platform to the death route was practically seamless, whereas here there's a transition. And it was like that in the original PS1 version as well. And once again... We can just bazooka these guys to get through much more safely. Okay, do you not want to take that iron checkpoint crate because it's going to make death warping out of here a lot harder because we'd still be stuck inside the death route. Oh, I remember this area. Yeah, there's there's a knife thrower down there on a very thin wooden walkway. Oh, we can at least get rid of the fire. So, I assume that in the alpha version, the green gem was still intended to be here, by simple virtue of the fact that the green gem isn't anywhere else, so by process of elimination, it had to be here. All of the other gems had their locations switched, but um, this one, no evidence of it being switched, so again, process of elimination, it likely had to be here. There's actually another interesting thing about the alpha version when it comes to death roots and Arabian levels and the knife throwers, but... I might as well talk about that a bit later. This guy can be a little bit annoying because he, um, he's a bit off screen, so it can be kind of hard to tell when the knives are coming, but, um, oh right, we don't even have to death warp out of this one. It's kind of weird that the high time death route warps you out of the level, but this one doesn't. And there's no boxes in here either, so, yeah, kind of weird that. But... On the subject of the bazooka, there's something else that I would kind of... Oh, I remember this. Okay, so I do think you have to backtrack very slightly here. And like I said, aiming the bazooka backwards is actually kind of awkward. Yeah, I, I thought there would be a magic carpet here. Just had a feeling. Yep, there are still some boxes back here. There. I think I can hear some guys throwing fire. 
Okay, yeah, here is where the death route originally was, so I believe we have fulfilled our backtracking quota. Can I get you from all the way over here? It's a little awkward while you're on these platforms, so I'm going to go ahead and not do that. But yeah, regarding the bazooka, I always felt like if Crash, um, slash Coco, I feel like you could easily have Coco as an Echo Fighter, but if Crash, uh, slash Coco ever ended up being in Smash Brothers, I feel like the bazooka would be part of their moveset, probably their normal B attack, I'm guessing. Because, I, like, I'm not sure, I kind of feel like Side B might be Tornado Spin, and you could combine that with, with like, a jump to get extra recovery, and Up B would either be the Jetpack from Crash 2, or the Rocket Jump, which was a power in the second Game Boy Advance game. That basically just launches you straight upwards dramatically. It's actually less useful than it sounds, because you have almost no horizontal momentum with it, but I guess you could kind of combine that with, um, Tornado Spin as a side B for recovery. Because, like, with the, like, the slide, I feel like the slide makes more sense as a dashing attack than it does as a, um, as a side B. So, something interesting about this bonus is that you... Well, okay, yeah. So, this bonus, while it doesn't really specify it, it is basically uh, teaching you how to use the bazooka. Because it's completely unsafe to get these get these boxes normally. Well, I think speedrunners do have method to doing them. And here, that um, that arrow box is also completely unsafe to touch. But make sure you have 28 out of 28 boxes by the time you leave this bonus. The reason will become apparent quite soon. And yeah, I see you in there. No fire throw will escape unscathed. We must get payback for all the... I don't actually think they ever burned us in any of the earlier levels, but they could have, and that's what matters. We must achieve payback. I think you are just slightly out of my range, though. And okay, yes, that is 75 out of 75, and that's important because, as you can see here, this is the end of the level. There's no Nitro Exploder in this level. You have to shoot the nitros with the bazooka in order to get the box jam. So that was a level that actually did trip me up quite a bit as a kid because I didn't really realize that. And to be fair, there is nothing in the level that directly tells you you have to bazooka the nitros in the bonus. But it's something that you're kind of expected to figure out just by the fact that you have the bazooka now. And because of that, I feel like it is the perfect level to enter right after finishing Warp Room 4 and also the fact that it lets you complete this level on your first pass. However, I'm actually going to break the order again and not do this, because I want to leave as many standard platforming levels as possible for the next part, which will be uh, the, like, the final one of the main story. So instead, I'm going to get one of the vehicle levels out of the way. I'm going to go for Mad Bombers, because it should be short. So it's time for a snowy biplane stage, and we get to see Crash's plane. So in the original version of the game, this was a Crash-only level. In this version, you can do it with Coco as well, and you can also pick um, Crash for Bye Bye Blimps. I think the enemies in this level are a little bit more dangerous. I think they do two damage, like two percent damage to you per shot instead of one percent damage. So it is slightly harder, but overall it's um, it's still not that bad. And speaking of slightly harder, your targets are moving now. You have to take out all the bombers, and they're a little bit more difficult to destroy than just the blimps. They have two engines, and you need to shoot out both of them. So yeah, that's one engine down, and there's the second one. They often make this really satisfying sound when you um, when you destroy them, but... Yeah, I guess that is one thing I can say about the Insane Trilogy. In a way, some of its sound effects don't really feel as, like, memorable as the ones from the original. Like, I actually prefer the original Chiding life sound uh, to this version's life sound. And and in the, uh, in the um, horror levels, the... The lab assistants that were carrying bricks had, had like, originally had these kind of hilarious Hurr! like, lifting noise that they did. It's not quite as audible in this version, which is kind of a shame. 
Okay, that's three bombers, and we already have the box gem, so no real reason to delay this any further. I'm guessing the reason why they um, made these levels accessible to both Crash and Coco in this version, but not the jet ski levels, for example, is that there was already like a model for Crash in a plane, so they could just port it over to Bye Bye Blimps and by extension port the Coco plane model over to Mad Bombers. And yep, that is Mad Bombers done. Like the other plane level, very short and fairly easy. Time trialing that one's a little bit more difficult though, since the bombers are moving targets. I might need to look up routes for that. So, with that, we've made headway in the fifth warp room and completed the fourth. We also have all five of the colored gems, and we've passed 80%. So next time we'll be taking on the rest of Warp Room 5 and facing off against Cortex in the final showdown. Or is it? So actually no fail channel for this part, but now we have the bazooka I can show off a couple of easter eggs in earlier levels that are worth achievement slash trophies in other versions. I mentioned that we'd be coming back to this Cortex Sphinx later. So if you aim in a specific spot, I think it's like around one of the eyes or the nose, there's a part where your reticle will turn, um, red. Yeah, there, so, um, there's a hidden life inside that somewhere, and if you hit it, you get an achievement or trophy for it. That was there in the original game, too. And the second easter egg that you can do with the bazooka... I'm so sorry. Is shooting the chickens in the medieval levels. There is an achievement slash trophy for doing this. I, I forget if it's just one or if you have to hit uh, multiple chickens. But that is another um, one of those trophies shown. And with that, I'll end this part for real. Actually, let's see if I can time this to get the life. There we go. And you get shot too. So with that, see you all next time.